Well, so I've been playing the 25th Ward. stuck down here. Could you like zoom in real quick? Yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah, so, so like I said, I'm stuck here with Suda. He <laughs> he's not doing so hot. He keeps telling me about this new city-state thing that's been built called the 25th Ward. An improved version of the 24th Ward from the last game. This one's clean, sleek, styling and airy as fuck. But also controlled and managed with zero room for individuality and functioning at maximum efficiency. A bit like Mirror's Edge's city, just more reflective. In it, you play as... No one. These two may very well don the box and they might be kinda important for a decent chunk of the game, but you experience so many other perspectives, places and characters that it would be unfair to give them all the credit. If anything, it's more about the city itself. It's police, criminals, conspiracy theories, politicians and all of the dark little secrets what these things may hide. Also, video game. Unlike its predecessor, the 25th Ward is not based off of an old PS1 game and instead an old flip phone game. So there's a lot less D-padding around menus as they just kind of copied Killer7's on rails multiple choice movement system where you can only do what do once prompt. Uh. Oh my god, I'm dying. The entire thing is chopped up into three stories consisting out of various chapters that unlock as you beat them one by one. The first focuses on Kuro and Jabroni of the Heinous Crimes Unit. Murders are happening, with possible ties to events of the first game and the 25th Ward very own Gestapo, i.e. the Militarized Postal Service. Yeah, that's right. They deliver packages, run simple errands, and kill those who break the rules. Or, uh, adjust them, as they call it. The gameplay here is mostly exploratory. Someone tells you to find a thing and where to find it, and then you go there. The second chapter is about Osato and Tsuki, who just so happen to be working for the governing bodies that rule over the postal services, cleaning up after their mess or taking on higher priority kills or doing research, leading them down a rabbit hole of corruption. Their gameplay is actually a simplified version of Flower, Sun and Rain, meaning that one has to derive codes from clues and enter those codes into jackholes to open doors. Luckily, shit's nowhere near as horrible as Flower, Sun and Rain was. No big math equations or hours of running, just shit as simple as finding a note with a date on it and filling that in as hard numbers. It's pretty cool. What with that newfangled UI making typing anything about as laborious as having to look through an entire seven-story flat block for one apartment with zero clues to go on. And the third and final story features freelance, but mostly in it for himself, journalist Tokyo Morishima who ends up uncovering most of the dark meat behind all of the game's plot twists through checking his email at nauseam and having really long chat conversations that require rather specific answers or back to the desktop -y ye go. I'm, uh, I'm gonna be honest. As a game, it's certainly nothing amazing. Better than either of its forebearers, absolutely, but that's mostly due to it being more streamlined than the silver case, which doesn't say much, and less of a likely cause of Japan's sky-high suicide levels than Flower, Sun and Rain, which also doesn't say much. The vast majority of the gameplay is best summed up as tedious. I have patience, so it's mostly fine by me, but it is primarily a game about having to meet certain requirements before being allowed to continue. You know, check the door three times, talk to the cat suit furry twice, put the tea on the scanner, that sort of thing. Not to mention the parts I just alluded to where you do actually spent like an hour running about four seven-story apartment buildings looking for a single room with naught but dick for cluage. It's part of the job, they said. That's just life. Which, yeah, it is, and I guess that's also kind of the thing too. 25th Ward is one giant commentary on what it means to be the player the main character, or even just to play in general. A commentary on what it means to be a person.
N no, no, not you, <laughs> motherfucker. This is not a David Cage game, so don't expect it to be generic or straightforward with what it has to say or that it will ever do what you expect it to do. Believe me, it won't. Even if you've seen this video and are like, heh, this little video game won't outsmart me. Trust me, it will. For one, just the fact that it having a first person view not signifying the viewing of any one person per se already puts it on kind of a weird tip. The first game had a player insert for sure, but even there they already kind of ran with it. Letting you attach your view, personality, and choices onto him, and then letting that character just go off to do its own thing. Essentially, taking your personality away from you. And yeah, <laughs> that sounds cheesy as dick, but it still managed to feel quite dark given the context that it was set in. And here, in the 25th Ward, it is built upon even further by A, having said player characters still big dicking around the place doing all manner of sketchy shit while looking scary AF fam, but also through B, not really letting you play as anyone per se. Sometimes there's an invisible, non-talking third party present whom can be addressed, but other times there isn't. And even then, who's to say that you're playing as them? A big part of this is the abstract framing for sure. The 3D representations, for example, never show any character models. Who's around is never fully clear or tangible in any way. You're only observing these people through an abstract, broken up view, only seeing what the director wisely decided to show. And uh, also C, <laughs> a lot of the gameplay is tedious on purpose. I know that that's usually the shit excuse that awkward Eurojank games use, though even with those I still have some shit to say in their defense, kind of. But the tone, the commentary, and other things that I will now highlight making listing them here kind of redundant, make this abundantly abundant. <coughs> Japanese adventure games, or RPG games as they were called, typically favored keys, big dialogue, and mazes over the more western standard of inventory fuckery and having a hand in conversation. You'll see this even today in the genres that spawned from them. Rusty keys, cooked keys, card keys, Alicia keys, you name it, they got it. So naturally, when the 25th ward goes full key on a boy, they dump like a billion on you at once. Koro starts bitching about keys being mysteries, and when you finally get to the place of key usage, where you need to say a password first, of course, you get some, uh, rather elaborate directions, which they then actually make you follow up on with a hint system that's equally shitposty. The characters meme around about wanting to speed this shit up, and I don't know, man. <laughs> I can't derive anything other from this than that it's meant to be a type of joke about how the adventure games Suda likely played growing up were designed. As are these Wii JRPG battles that happen during one chapter. Luckily though, this game doesn't really deal in fill states. It's never hard or punishing, it's just kind of tedious at times. This is my review of the 25th Ward for the PlayStation 4 and the Steam platforms, respectively. I have never heard of this series before. Apparently, this is the 25th one in the series. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense why it's the 25th one, but I guess it is. You know, Japanese people are weird. Speaking of them heard this game was made by some infamous developer. I think his name was Sweary69. It's kind of gross when I think about it. For a game mostly consisting out of text and still images, it sure as fuck has a strong cinematic presence. Which offers a society coded in management, with no room for personality and functioning at maximum efficiency. 
essentially allowing one to disappear within its towering flat blocks in which everyone lives alone in their featureless cupboard condos. Shit's bound to attract some sketchy folk. Especially when said folk are all selected as bred to be elite. Big egos, large complexes and lavish fetishes all collide inside a compressed space with strict rules that could lead to immediate adjustment to bond being broken. So most people take to sheltered lives online, scouring the deep web getting roped up into conspiracies. Mainly one about a serial killer called Kamui. Dude, kinda went a bit ham in the first game, inspiring his very own cult-like following. These days, though, he exists only as a collective conscience, thriving once certain socio-political requirements have been met. Kinda like fascism here in the real world. When spirits get down and people get stupid, there will always be some corrupt scumfuck out to use their newly formed gullibility and desperation to gain power quickly and perhaps even weaponize it. Kumui, though, is a bit more abstract, bringing out the hatred and murderous intent within those most susceptible. Now, you would have a reason to think that this would just result in the standard trope of copycat killers, but no. <laughs> this game is too good for tropes. See, as I said, the 25th Ward is filled with bread to bees. The actual Kamui, who may have once existed like a serial killer Jesus, is used as a template to create the perfect citizen. Someone who would calmly follow orders and never break the rules. Docile, collected, taking his character traits yet forgoing the whole murderous thing. All of this was done through shelters. A place where a bunch of kids would be raised and brainwashed to be this way. And Sadly, many of these people and those with similar dead inside sociopathic traits are what the 25th Ward wants in order to form its so-called utopia. Naturally, this backfires because who knew that the people who are copies of a serial killer would be susceptible to the prevalent cultural legacy of said serial killer? Wow! Basically, people kill way easy. Even the good guys in this game are all calm, collected killers who shoot people by the dozen and maybe even enjoy it. Oh, and uh, those postal service police people have digital enhancements allowing their brains to be a big brother database of everything people say and do online or offline. So, when you get creepy backdoor websites that promote said cultural legacy, even they will become woke to the murderous intent. So, uh, yeah, everyone's Kamui, yay! <laughs> Anyone can kill, like it don't mean shit, and some use that for good, while others just go ham on each other for even something as minor as taking out the trash on the wrong day. In a way, this does kinda reach Kingdom Hearts levels of everyone is Xehanort, and I can see this maybe being hard to follow for those more cynical, but it is in how shit's framed through the characters involved where all of this starts feeling surprisingly down to earth. The 25th Ward goes in pretty deep on its what it means to be a person thing and how that relates to what I just explained. There's many characters and many side stories that give it tons of weight and while I'd like to forgo talking about most of them because spoilers, I wish to highlight at least one just to prove my point. So uh, half out of context spoilers for a single character out of literally dozens, I guess. Anyway, this story is about a girl who grew up in one of those Kamui shelters. She doesn't remember any of it due to it being too traumatic and has spent most of her life afterwards as an underage prostitute. She has no memories, no hobbies, no emotions or personality to call her own. She questions nothing, feels nothing and simply wakes up on the daily to the remnants of vile drugged up sexual acts. But then, one day she gets bought by a man called the good looking guy. He runs an online sex chat room that uses real girl controlled bot duplicates of this one pretty lady what dudes like and stuff. He treats her well, actually. Teaches her about the world, reads her books and gives her a flaccid sense of self worth as he puts her to work. And through talking to the customers as this bot clone of another girl, she actually starts to develop feelings, emotions and thoughts. Asking them questions about life, death, sex, love, uh, anything really. She essentially develops a personality through a bot AI of someone else's personality while talking to horny dudes online who are no doubt lying about their personality. And that's some fucking shit right there. Naturally, the game explores this to the point where it becomes uncomfortable, 
showing you how it affects those around her as they try to live their kinky lives in this cynically run clinical society. I genuinely mean it when I say that <laughs> I have never read anything like this before. At times, the game legit left me feeling existential after playing, and often put me in a really weird mood. And shit's addictive to read too. The game's broken up structure tends to introduce you to its characters, like the girl I just talked about a fair bit before it starts dumping its twist on you. Meaning that you already care, knowing full well what the implications of each character-centric reveal are in regards to the greater context of it all. Bit by bit, shit just starts to make sense more and more, like a disturbing, emotional, off-putting and rewarding eureka type moment. And through all of that, Suda's sense of humor and his tendency towards interesting characters help keep shit grounded and just weirdly likable overall. Yeah, so there's a lot of fucking talking in this game. Easily, shit could have been boring as all dick and to many it may very well be. But it's hard to deny how much flavor there is to all of its titular talking. Characters like the coroner who rambles on like a fucking rumor milling valley girl about his collection of snuff films. <laughs> Or his delivery girl who's a big mouth, cheeky school girl who openly gives people shit. Or this weird bald dude who lives behind a vending machine working as a professional witness, giving you hints about various crimes through handing you experimental off-market soda pops. And even the flamboyant gay internet cafe owner who organizes offline parties and is referred to as master make the game a fuck of a whole lot more fun to read through than it has any right to be. Especially our main cast help with this a lot, as while you might not directly play as them, your view of this world is still filtered through their words and experiences. Kuro, who may very well be a cold heart bitch down to kill for bitness, is also a regular at the just now mentioned internet cafe and <laughs> even works part time as a booth babe at conventions. She has quite some freaky experiences, coloring in what she says quite nicely. At also, I just really appreciate this game character building through fetishes without it being used to shame anyone into a villainous role. It's pretty cool. All of the main boys and girls though have loads of quirky, well explored and meaningful traits. Like how Osato is essentially the Baka-chan ganky girl and looks like a cat eye tomboy. Except he's a dude who enjoys killing people a bunch. Or uh, I mean they all do, let's be fair. but. By the time I witnessed a story about a ghost seeing schoolgirl in the trademark ESP, -er, <laughs> I was pretty much sold. Meme suit has pension for weird characters all you want. Sure, with games like No More Heroes and Lollipop Chainsaw, the weirdness is essentially just that, but here it legit adds a fuck ton. I mean, when you're in a place that has back alley encryption furries, 7 Eleven bathroom confessionary key appraisals, and women who are pawned off as wives to lonely dudes who work in the killing business, not to mention the basement Nazis, the cam go robots, and the fact that everyone is a psychopathic clone of a serial killer, you really kind of need some more lighthearted banter to frame it and balance it off. Either way though, <laughs> shit's pretty fucking cool. This game sucks dick. People talk too much, the story's way too confusing and badly paced and it's barely even a fucking game to begin with. Sure, it looks and sounds fucking amazing, but that's also all you get. Style over substance. This game is fucking profound. It changed me and how I view certain things. It left me feeling existential, yet it also made me fall in love with its characters. It is a genuinely genius subversion of video games as a whole and a deeply meaningful commentary on what it means to be a person. It's okay, I guess. Great game to get if you like Suda, but definitely not for everyone. Really, if you get right down to it, it's actually just a sequel hook for a DS game that came out over a decade ago, so uh... Yeah, it's a bit hard to recommend, but I enjoyed my time with it for the most part since a few really annoying bits. There, you picked the conclusion. Whichever one works best for you.